time we started uh, the this important discussion of understanding electromagnetic radiation, and we have some prescribed sources that are moving in space and radiating electromagnetic waves. And to do that, we began uh, by looking at uh, the wave equation for a scalar wave uh, that is being driven by some source term. And to solve that equation, the particular solution is found uh, in a general form by convolving the source in space and time with the green function associated with the wave equation. So we looked for solutions of this equation, which uh, we found, and we found two kinds of solutions, so-called retarded solutions and advanced solutions, which correspond to either spherical wave fronts that are emanating from X prime or converging onto X prime, okay? The wave fronts that are emanating from the point are the retarded time solutions, the ones that go backwards in time and converge on the point are the advanced time solutions. Both are solutions. And they're used in different contexts. In particular, in scattering theory, when we think about in and out waves with asymptotic boundary conditions, we often use, in the time-dependent formulation of scattering theory, one uses both the advanced and retarded time solution. But in the con current context where we're talking about a source that is radiating, we're looking for the radiation that emanates from that, then we think about the causal solutions, and those are the retarded time solutions. Those are the causal solutions. Can you take the reason for the name? Uh, Retardation. Uh, I think that's you know that that is one semantic notion of if something is retarded in time, it's backwards in time. That's one semantic meaning of the word. Okay, it means it, it's it's in our, my future. That's where that. There's no political context. In this. Alright, um, so uh, we then see uh, that this, if we convolve the Green's function with the source, then the general solution uh, is a weighting of the strength of the source by an amount uh, that falls off like 1 over the distance, but what we see, the wave amplitude we see at our time t, at our position x, depends upon what the source was doing at the retarded time. The retarded time is the time, the current time, minus the time it takes for a light signal to travel from x prime to x. So what I see currently is what the source was doing in the past. Of course, you know, astronomers know this very well. Um, so we can depict that on a, a space-time diagram where this axis is representing one coordinate of space, and this is time. And thinking about this is my position at the present, time t. And the signal that I see at my position at the present depends upon what the source was doing on my backward light cone. Meaning to say, uh, this, these are all the space-time points in the past, in my past, at the corresponding to this current time, uh, that correspond to a light signal that can reach that point. And so the total signal that I will see will be a weighting of the sources over all the, the world lines that cross my backward light cone, added up appropriately with the one over distance 
scaling events related to the spherical wave. All right? It's a nice picture. Um, so now we're looking at this in the particular context of electromagnetism. This is a general uh, formulation of waves, whether this was the speed of light or the speed of sound, the same uh, <laughs> mathematics holds and the same physical description would then hold in that case as well. Um, things get a little bit more complicated for electromagnetic waves because they're vector waves. Okay? And uh, so anyway, uh, to do this, so we're looking now for general solutions to Maxwell's equations. And to do that, what we, we do is we formulate things in terms of the potentials. We solve for the potentials given a certain source and then find the fields from the potentials. So uh, these are the equations, the Maxwell's equations without the sources. They are the ones that determine the relationships between the fields and the potentials. And these equations we see have gauge invariance. That is to say, we make these transformations on the scalar and vector potential, then the fields are left unchanged. So there is a freedom we have in choosing these functions uh, that give the same physics. And we, make, we can, in principle, make a gauge transformation uh, in this way. Um, so when we take these potentials and we plug them into the source equations, the Ampere's law and the Gauss's law, then we find these equations of motion for the potentials. Okay? And they can be written uh, different ways depending on our choice of gauge. So two standard choices that are made in thinking about uh, electrodynamics are the so-called Lorentz gauge, so-called because this gauge condition is uh, the same in all inertial reference frames. We get a very simple form for the uh, um, equations of motion for the potentials, the scalar and vector potentials. And they are just the wave equations with sources. Okay. Um, oh, I, I failed to emphasize here to remind you that in the context of dynamics, the vector potential plays a much more prominent role. The electric field depends not just on the gradient of phi, but also the time derivative of A. And in fact, in radiation, this is the whole story. The rest of it is just there to make sure the field is transverse, um, in a sense. Um, so, for the Lorentz gauge, the equations uh, are exactly of the form we described here, and we have the solution. Okay, and this, we're going to use this guys, but I do want to mention that there is another choice of gauge that we can, oh, that is often made, and that's the so-called Coulomb gauge, so, which is to set, or sometimes known as the transverse gauge. It's called transverse because the vector potential is set to be a transverse field. Its divergence is set to zero. That's a perfectly good gauge choice. If we do that, then phi looks like Coulomb's law. This is the Poisson equation, which is the electrostatic Coulomb's law. That's why it's called the Coulomb gauge. Um, but it's not to say that it's really static because, of course, the true electric field depends not just on the gradient of phi, but also on the uh, derivative with respect to A. In this gauge, the vector potential has a wave equation, but with a source term that is only the part. Remember, in our very first problem set, we said that any vector field can be broken up into a part that has that is defined by its curl and its divergence, 
right? So we can, the part of the source that contributes to the vector potential in the transverse gauge is the transverse part of the current. Okay, and then we can solve this uh, for the vector potential. This is actually a useful form when dealing, as we'll, we'll kind of touch base with this a little bit later on, when we're talking about electromagnetic radiation for non-relativistic charges. Um, because it kind of breaks up the potential into the part that's kind of the static part and the part that's the radiation part. All right. So that's where we were. Anybody have any questions? All right. So um, what we want to talk about today is multipole radiation. So when we were talking about statics, you know, we had similar kinds of solutions, but instead of the retarded time, this was the local time. And well, actually, there was no time at all. It was static. Um, but uh, that when what we did is we looked at, for example, the situation where we had localized sources and we did a multipole expansion. We want to do the same thing now for the dynamic case. All right? So we're going to look at a situation where we have some localized distribution of sources, and they're, you know, doing whatever the heck they're doing. So this is my source, rho, as a function of position and time. And J is a function of position and time. Okay? And here I am, the observer, with my beautiful eyeball. And I want to know something about the electromagnetic field at my point. So there's some origin somewhere, right? And the, the position of the observer we call X. Okay? And so we know now how to find the potentials. We just have to integrate these things, OK? So we have some, there's some position of the source, just like we did when we talked about statics. X prime is some position within the source. And there's some strict dr, which is the distance from the source point to me, 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 me. All right. So, well, we just have to do this integral. Now, we want to do this in certain approximations associated with the multiple expansion. So, we're assuming that there is some characteristic size of the source. Dimension D. Um, and what we talked about in uh, when we were talking about statics is the multipole. One important uh, notion of the multipole expansion is that we were far away compared to the size of the source. We just had net charge, we'd see a monopole. If there was no net charge, then the first non vanishing thing was a dipole, etc. So the first approximation we're going to make is the assumption there are small parameters. <clears throat> One is that uh, the size of the source is much smaller than the distance I am away from the source. So we're calling R the magnitude of the vector that describes my position relative to the R. So this is this seems to be small compared to one. That was what we had when we talked about statics. But there's another very important approximation now in the context of dynamics. So the sources here are moving around, and um, we are going to make another. So we have a, a so the first approximation here was that we had. Uh, a compact source 
and we are far away. The other approximation we're going to make is that the motion is slow. What do I mean by slow? Whenever we talk about notions of big and small in physics, it's always the ratio of things. Okay? Um, well, we have one uh, important constant here, and that's the speed of light. So what I mean by this is non-relativistic. So we're having source, the charges are not moving close to the speed of light. When they are, these are the approximations we're going to make go to hell. And if we had more time, we would study, and one should study, the radiation of relativistically moving charges. Some very important problems, especially in astrophysical context and so forth. But we're just not going to get there, I don't think, this semester. Um, so, what, is it, what does that mean? That's saying there's some characteristic, not only size of the source, but let's say there's a characteristic time uh, that charges move over distance d. Okay? So that means their characteristic speed is d over t. Uh, so what we're assuming here is that d over t is much, much smaller than the speed of light. So that's, those are the two approximations which we're going to make. Now this approximation, yes sir? So I'm sorry, are you saying that t is like the period of the spin of the object? Um, okay, so right now I'm just saying there's, there's some characteristic speed of the charges and they're moving around. And there's some time of scale that it moves from one side of the source. They're moving around in some arbitrary way at this point. So basically and they're just saying that the time that light propagates across the sample is tiny, absolutely tiny, to compare to the time it takes them, the, the charge to move from one place to another across the sample. For example, if I had an atom, okay? We have, you know, an angstrom. The time it takes light to travel across an atom is tiny, even for, you know, well, sort of depends on how strong the uh, the binding is. I mean, for very highly, you know, for a very high z atom, when you start getting into relativistic orbits, maybe it's not true. But for hydrogen, even though it's moving, you know, one over 137 of the speed of light. It's still, the time it takes light to across a Boreas is tiny compared to that speed. So when we talk about atomic uh, um, rate, uh, absorption and emission of electromagnetic radiation by atoms, we always mean a multipole expansion. Talk about dipole radiation. Okay, so. Um, what, I just wanted to emphasize another point related to this approximation, uh, which is, let's suppose that in, we look at a particular case where we, where we have harmonic motion. Right, so that 1 over t is like the frequency of the oscillations. So we have maybe an oscillating charge back and forth. Um, so, uh, what do we have here? Um, this, that means that this approximation is equivalent to saying uh, D is much, much less than C over omega, which is like the wavelength associated with electromagnetic radiation that was oscillating at that frequency. So another way of stating for the case where we have harmonic oscillation 
and is often talked about as the dipole approximation when you talk when you hear about that in say uh, uh, you know perturbation theory and hydrogen matter or something like that is that the wavelength is much much bigger than the size of the sound it's equivalent it's the same thing as saying that the time it takes the charges to move across the sample is very, very slow compared to the speed of light. All right, so those are the, those are the approximations we're going to make, um, which are useful in a in multitude of contexts. And now we want to use that to do a multiple expansion of the hour potential. So we're going to look at the Lorentz gauge solution. So let's, for the moment, use the Lorentz gauge. And, uh, well, first of all, uh, one of our first approximation basically is saying that this distance is approximately equal to R minus R hat dot x prime, right? If we just were to expand, remember this is equal to the square root of r squared plus r prime squared plus 2x dot x prime. And if all of the r's are very big, compared to all the r primes, we can take this out and expand this to first order action. Uh, I should just get minus and we get that. That's just saying that this distance is approximately this distance plus or minus, you know, minus the amount by which this is projected onto here, right? Think about this like you know, we did when you think about double slit experiments and the two rays and how you subtract off a little extra piece. Um, okay, so that meant that one over x minus x prime was approximately 1 over r plus r prime over r squared dot x. That's the kind of expansion we used when we were doing the multipolar expansions. Um, this has nothing to do with the right table. We'll come back to that. So I don't want to confuse you. This is just this. <laughs> OK. Um, so what about what are, so that's one approximation. You can expand this, of course, to higher orders. We get one bar cubed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, that appears here, but there's a there's also this fact that the retarded time here. Remember, the retarded time is the local time at my position of observation minus the time it takes. Uh, light to go from the source point to me. Now, there's many retarded times. There's a retarded time from the origin. There's a retarded time from this point. There's a retarded time. They're all slightly different. But they're not very different because this source is very compact and the thing is moving very slowly. Okay? So, let's do a little aside over here. Let's consider a function of t evaluated at the retarded time, which is f t minus for some particular point of observation and some particular point within the source. Now, under the assumption that the time it takes light to travel across the sample is tiny compared to uh, the, uh, the motion of the particle, we can do an expansion around the retarded time at the origin. The additional, additional retarded times from other points outside the origin is a small correction. So, we write this as f of t minus, uh, we have over here, r plus r hat dot x prime over c. So this is the retarded time from the origin. 
And this is the little extra piece of the retarded time that's coming from uh, the fact that I'm at some source point that's not exactly at the origin. Okay? So this, I'll just call T0. That's the retarded time. In the first server, so I have a C denominator? It uh, should indeed, thank you. Sometimes C is one in my head, and sometimes it's not. <clears throat> so far. Okay, so under the slowly varying approximation that this is small. Um, compared to P naught, then we can do a Taylor series expansion of this, evaluating at T naught plus the little extra piece of the retarded time times the derivative of this evaluated at T naught. Chapter. have the ingredients, let's look at our potentials. Now let's use a Lorentz gauge. The scalar potential, which is at the exact expression as such, is approximately equal to So this is the monopole. 
in this dielectric dipole. changing magnetic fields, and those changing magnetic fields through Faraday's law, through electromagnetic induction, can give rise to uh, electric fields. But that's not necessarily radiation. Okay, we'll explain that a little bit more carefully in a moment. But also importantly, and electromagnetic radiation. Now, I only kept this first order term because I'm keeping terms to the same order in our small parameters. So this is of zeroth order in the small parameter. Uh, this is a, a first order in the small parameter because this depends on the size of the distribution over R compared to this. So it's got like a D over R. And this has a CT, which is like a, which is also a small parameter because the time derivative is like that, and that compared to D over CT is small. And what we have over here, D over CT, is another small parameter. D is the extent of the source. T is the time scale over which this changes. So this is all kept to a consistent order in our small parameter. All right, uh, now we need the vector potential. expansions in magnetostatics. It's kind of a nasty thing. Uh, this first term here vanished. We related that to 
to the magnetic monopole. And we argued, we showed that that term was zero. We had this aside here which said, this is what we call x prime, that the integral over x prime of j and x prime was the same thing as the minus the integral of x prime times the divergence of j. Okay, using some tensor algebra. We showed that last some months ago. Now, when we're talking about this in the context of magnetostatics, magnetostatics is defined by the fact that the divergence of J is zero. But now we're not talking about magnetic statics no more. We're talking about dynamics. And so, what is the divergence of J? Conservation of charge tells us that is equal to negative rho dot. Excellent. So the minus signs cancel, and this becomes the derivative with respect to t of the integral x prime rho of x prime at the t naught, which is equal to the dipole moment at T nut, electric dipole moment. So this contribution here is equal to the derivative of the electric dipole. Remember, when you have moving charges, moving dipoles, you can have current. We had so-called polarization current when we're looking at the macroscopic uh, maximum. So this is the lowest non vanishing term from the same order that we kept here. So it's the low to the same order that we kept. That we retained in phi. The vector potential is approximately equal to P dot over C R. Okay. All right. Now I'll get my notes to remind myself of some things. find the fields from the potentials. Remember, we have to be, pay close attention because the electric field uh, depends both on the vector potential as well as the scalar potential. So my electric field is equal to <coughs> minus the gradient of the scalar potential minus 1 over C the ADP. So we got to plug that in. Um, this is equal to, let's take this derivative because that one's easy. That's equal to minus 1 over uh, c squared with rho double dot evaluated at t naught. 
R, and then we have to do minus the gradient scale. As we'll see in a moment, this is the term that has to do with electromagnetic radiation, really. That second derivative in time of the dipole moment related to the acceleration of the charges. And you remember that accelerating charges radiate. So it's the second time derivative that matters. This is going to be related to a piece that makes this a transverse function, as it must be in free space, far away from the charges, as well as the parts that are not related to radiation, which are the near-field contributions. OK, now there's a whole bunch of algebra that's boring as all hell, that I'll, so I'll just skip it and give you the answer, OK? So, you know, just as a, just, you know, note, um, when taking the gradient, um, if we look at, for example, uh, the gradient of r hat dot p evaluated at p minus r over c, make sure that we take the gradient with respect to R, but also this thing depends on this argument. Right? So when you take that, you have to use the chain rule. Make sure you take the gradient on this as well. That's where things get messy and annoying. Yeah? Do you have to worry about the unit Well, we've got to write that out. Remember, how would I do this? I would take this as the gradient of x dotted into p over r cubed. Write this as x sub i, p sub i, evaluated at the retarded time. Right? And then I would, uh, this is the gradient. Now I would look at the jth component of that. And I would take, I have to use all that tensor algebra stuff that we did earlier in the semester. It's no fun to one inch that. Maybe it's not fun to watch any of this, but you know, at least pick and choose this might be a little bit more. Okay, so um, what do we get to do that? So the electric field comes out to be the following. We have the Coulomb field, that is to say one over R squared times the total charge. Right? That's just a cool field. We have the electric field of, of a dipole, which is evaluated. So the field of an electric dipole in statics, you remember, falls off like one over R cubed. And this is the anisotropic dipole field. The one, you know, the one that looks like that. That's this. Then we got other stuff. Plus 3 r hat. r hat divided into p dot t. That retarded time from the origin minus the first derivative That came from this kind of thing. Taking the derivative of the chain rule will give us that first derivative. And then finally, minus 1 over c squared, p double dot, p dot, minus r hat, divided by 1 over r. So this first term comes from the vector potential. That's what we had over here. And the second term comes from 
the scalar potential, which tracks off a piece that's along r hat. Okay, so how do we interpret these different terms in the field? Oh, before I do that, I guess I should write down with the magnetic field, please. This is the quasi-static E field of an electric dipole. This term we call, this is complicated, we'll discuss it in a moment, we call the induction. And this term is what we call, the term that falls off like 1 over r, we call radiation. Similarly, for this, this is the induction field, and this is radiation. Why do we call it as such? Well, the important thing is how does the field fall off as a function of the distance from the R? What characterizes the radiation, electromagnetic radiation, from a localized distribution is that it falls off like 1 over R and no faster. Why is that electromagnetic radiation? Why would we consider that to be electromagnetic radiation, whereas the things that fall off faster than 1 over R in the field, this is not the potential, this is the field, is not considered radiation? Well, what that has to do with is the question of whether or not the energy can be radiated away to infinity. So here's the source, it's doing its thing. And it's radiating or creating a field. And we want to know what is the flux of energy through a sphere as the radius of that sphere goes to infinity. Well, that flux of energy is given by V 
the pointing vector integrated through the surface of the sphere. Okay? And the pointing vector, let's look at the time average, not that that matters much, but it's just easier to write it down this way, is proportional to the magnitude of E squared, or E times B, if we like. But well, let's write it as E times B. Let's, let, let, let's, let's emphasize some facts here. So let's go back and forget about the time averages. This is proportional to B cross B. The area here scales is in on the, the unit of area on the sphere is proportional to R squared times the unit of solid angle. So if E times B falls off any faster than r squared, then as the radius goes to infinity, the product of the intensity times the area will fall off with distance. And as the radius goes to infinity, there'll be no, nothing left. There'll be no flux. In order to have the flux go off to infinity, in other words, the energy be radiated away, then this must be, so in order for S dot N hat dA uh, to be finite as R goes to infinity, the magnitude of E cross D must be proportional to 1 over R squared. So that the product of E cross B and this is a constant. So that whatever energy is radiated is radiated through that surface, no matter where the surface is. That's what we call radiation. Radiation is the um, fields detaching themselves from the charges, having a life of them their own, being free to fly, and leaving the mothership. Okay? So, these are the radiation. These are the terms that correspond to radiation. Um, in the context of the electric dipole, what we see is that uh, there is, if we're close enough in, there is a field that looks, uh, so if I were to sketch, you know, suppose I have a, a, a dipole that's oscillating. Okay. What would the field look like? Well, nearby, when R is small, this term dominates, right? So we have this kind of electric dipole. If we're far enough away from the source that this thing falls off like one of our R cubed, it's tiny. We would imagine we would see radiation, which would mean we would see wave fronts. That are So here's my electric field, up and it's down. It's up and it's down. These electric field lines out here, they have zero divergence. They close on themselves. They correspond to the radiating fields inside of the body stack. In between, well, it's kind of a transition. It's kind of a giant mess. I mean, but what we know is that if we have some oscillating fields, they create currents. If those currents are changing in time, magnetic fields change in time. If the magnetic fields change in time, 
then according to Faraday's law, you get electric fields. That's the induction terms. Okay, but you remember from our problem set that that energy never radiates away. You can bring it back to the sources. Remember this, we, you know, we spun up the cylinder, we made up an energy, but then we can de-spin the cylinder and all the energy comes back. That's not true, radiation. For radiation, there's a, a dissipation of sorts. Energy is lost, it flies away, and unless there's a mirror out here, it ain't gonna come back. All right, so let's take a, a closer look at these terms again to understand these different, what we call radiation zones. In fact, even if a monopole uh, was changing in any way, it doesn't appear that there's no derivative of the monopole anywhere. It's only derivatives of the dipole. So monopoles don't contribute to radiation. The first non-vanishing contribution is a changing dipole, electric dipole, not changing monopole. So that's why I'm just ignoring the monopole contribution because it doesn't do anything relative to radiation. So what we found is that the electric field had, we had three contributions. We have something that goes like the strength of the dipole over R cubed, something that goes like the derivative of the dipole over C R squared. This is what we call the static, the induction, or quasi-static, the induction, and the radiation. Why do I say this term dominates when I'm close to the charge, and this dominates when I'm far, and then there's this intermediate zone. Well, um, what we said, let's what we said is here, let's assume we had um, a characteristic time to change. Of the, char or of the charge distribution, or change of the dipole moment. C, which each, for example, could be the period of oscillation, if we have an oscillating charge. Then we can look at the scaling here. This is light travels in the time t. The relationship between those three different dis di distances tells us something about uh, the um, relative strengths of these different terms. If t is like uh, 
1 over omega, then CT, right, is like C over omega, which is like lambda. If we were thinking about this as an oscillating charge distribution. So this is like lambda. Here I've factored out the same term P over R cubed. The question is, how big is R compared to lambda? When R is small compared to lambda, then that's what we call the near field. When R is big compared to lambda, that's what we call the far field. And this we call the induction zone, or the intermediate zone. So that's why this picture looks like it does. When we're looking at our source at a distance that's small compared to the wavelength associated with the radiation at the characteristic frequencies, it looks quasi-static. If we're looking at the source way far away, where the distance is big compared to that wavelength, then we see the radiation. So if I have, suppose I have a coil of wire, which is oscillating at a megahertz. Well, if I'm looking at it near the coils, it looks like a Helmholtz coil with a magnetic field that's just changing back and forth. But if I look at it way far away, then it looks like an antenna, which is radiating, well, in that case, magnetic dipole radiation, but, you know, the same idea. So the nature of the field that we see depends upon where we are. When we're close enough to the source, it looks quasi-static. When we're very far from the source, we see the radiation. If where is a radiation term to be had, which means if there is a second time derivative, there's acceleration. So you remember when we are talking about quasi-statics, we said if the time it took for light to travel across my inductor was instantaneous, essentially, compared to the time scale over which the currents change, we didn't need to think about radiation. That is where that approximation came from. All right? Okay. In physics, we need time to do that. All right. So um, let's now, in the last uh, bit of the last 10 minutes, let's talk about what does the radiation field look like and what are some of its characteristics. So what we call dipole radiation. What we have is that the electric field, that position in time, is that term that's uh, circled over there. It's minus uh, P double dot evaluated at T naught minus uh, R hat dotted times R hat dotted into P at T naught over C squared R. Okay, the magnetic field. We said 
is equal to minus r hat cross into p double dot. So what can we say? Does this have the characteristics that we expect from electromagnetic radiation? And what kind of, is this a plane wave? Is it a spherical wave? What the heck is this? What kind of radiation are we talking about? Let's consider the case where we have a dipole, which is um, moving at linearly in some direction. So this is P as a function of T. Okay, it's going, it has some charges moving along the line. It has some electric dipole like that. Let's say at some instance of time, it's, it's time to it is along this direction. Now, I'm at some distance from this dipole. The electric field I see, so this, let's say, is P double dot, is in that direction. Here is R hat. What direction is the electric field that I see from the electromagnetic creation at that point? In what direction is it? Well, what I have to do is I have to subtract off the component of, this should be double dot, pardon me, excuse me. I have to subtract off the part of P double dot that's along R hat. I, so there is a part of this vector which is parallel, and there's a part of this vector which is perpendicular to R hat. And I subtract off the parallel component. And the electric field associated with the radiation is the transverse component of P double dot. That's what's here. This is the component of P which is perpendicular to the direction in which the wave is propagating. That's what we expect. We expect transverse waves. What about B? Well, B is just R crossed into E, which is kind of what we expect. We know if we have a wave propagating in this direction, then the direction of the magnetic field is given by the cross product of the direction propagation with the electric field. So the magnetic field here, this is E, and this is B. So these are transverse waves. Perpendicular to direction of propagation radially outward. They're spherical. see that spherical wave nature uh, more explicitly when the, we take the particular condition that the time-dependent dipole is oscillating harmonically. So let's consider harmonic Oscillation. P, as a function of time, let's say is the real part of some vector. For the moment, I'll just make it a real vector. Okay? That means that E, the radiation, will end up radiating for electric dipole with that same frequency. Well, that's, it's actually the function of position of time. So it's going to have some complex amplitude with function of position. 
Let's put that in. Let's plug this in to this formula for complex frequency. So my radiating field, which ultimately I'll take the real part of, is equal to each dot becomes a minus i omega. So I get it omega squared over c squared. I get this evaluated at t minus r over c. That's at the retarded time, at from the origin. That's from this thing. And then I have p naught per over r. Where p naught per is equal to p naught minus the component that's along r. What is this? It's a spherical wave. This is equal to k squared times e to the i k r minus omega t over r times p naught per. So the electric field radiated by this oscillating dipole is a spherical wave. Note, 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 where did this kr minus omega t came? It came from the retarded time. It's just saying that the field that I see, the oscillation that I see at my time, depended upon what the oscillation was doing at an earlier time, depending on how far it traveled. That means that they have to phase shift the oscillation I see by the phase accumulated by the amount that it propagated. That's all that means. That's all what KR means. It's a phase shift relative to the source oscillation. Now, there's one last piece that I want to, before we quit, what about this P per business? What this says is that the strength of the electric field is not isotropic, even though the wave fronts are spherical. The strength of the wave is not the same at every position along here because of P per. So if this is P naught, this is the direction of oscillation, and I'm looking at it over here, and this is the angle theta, then P per is equal to the magnitude of P naught times the sine of theta. So that is to say that if I were to look at the strength of the radiation, if, if, the, uh, if I'm looking at it over here in my eyeball, and the oscillation is here, there's no radiation along there, because there's no way for it to be transverse. Sine of theta is zero. If I'm looking at it over here, I see only transverse oscillations. I see strong fields. And as a function of theta, I see the strength of the field as a function of theta falls off. This is what's known as a dipole radiation pattern, which we will discuss more next time. All right. OK, these notes will be posted. Lots of good stuff to read.